M S W Media. Hey, it's Kimberly, host of the Start Me Up podcast. If you like your politics with some loose talk and salty language, you're going to love my show. I interview the coolest people like Mary Trump, Kathy Griffin, and DNC chair Jamie Harrison. The Start Me Up podcast has an easygoing, casual style and a strong emphasis on left-leaning politics. We also have frank discussions about sex and more than a few spirited rants. Just visit patreon.com slash startmeup or wherever you get your podcasts and start listening today. Rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 47 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's December 8th. I'm your co-host, Allison Gillen. With me, as usual, is real-life lawyer and my good friend, <laughs> co-host, Andrew Torres. Oh, always a pleasure. Love being here. This is uh, our first episode of the month of December, so you know what that means. It's time to thank our new patrons, but also time to shout out our Hall of Famers. Ooh, all right. I'll take our new patrons. Thank you so much to Tracy McFadden. To Detective Matthew Maxson, very cool name, Brian Melcher, Clown Car Crash, and of course, Jake Matthews. <laughs> and a recurring special thanks to our all-time greats, so I'm going to start with that. Operation BrownyPockets.com is a free game you play in real life. Check that out. Not that, Chris Wallace, Jamil R. Chohan, Neil Upadaya, Jessica Outbeer, Dude, the Earth is 70% uncarbonated water, therefore the Earth is flat. <laughs> Lance Buckley, and uh, take it away, Alice. Ah, are the top 10, right? Lance Buckley, Crimer, no criming. David in Brooklyn. Hello, David. Uh, for Stiffy, I still don't know how to say that. I think Medi that's good. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Medicon 7, Charles Jones, January 20, baby. Woot, woot. Chris Waltrip, uh, Patty B. Mitchell, and our all time great. Chris Simpson. Woo! Thank you so much, and sincerely, uh, we couldn't do the show without you. So remember that you too can get a shout out on the show, plus the ad free feed, plus bonus stuff, plus you know it's a good way of thanking Allison and I for doing the show. Head on over patreoncom slash a i s l e four five p o d aisle forty five pod and uh, hit us up for as little as a buck an episode. And now with that out of the way, on with the show. First story, Allison, today, the Department of Justice filed a federal lawsuit in the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas, seeking declaratory and injunctive relief against the state of Texas and the Texas Secretary of State in connection with the state legislature's recently enacted redistricting plan that would, of course, benefit non-Hispanic whites, referred to as Anglos in the lawsuit, and burden uh, everyone else in electing candidates to both the U.S. House of Representatives as well as the Texas State House. Yeah, yeah. The, the the this redistricting plan would first of all allow white voters to defeat Latino candidates in District 23. Mm -hmm. Next, it would massively dilute the strength of minority and Latino voters in nine districts, nine districts in the greater Dallas Fort Worth area, and it would dilute Latino voting strength in 10 districts in Harris County, and Finally, it would gerrymander a bunch of state house districts, including San Antonio, South Texas, El Paso, and West Texas. Yeah, it, it, all of this is in the complaint, but here's the bottom line. Here's the way to think about this. So the 2020 census showed that Texas uh, was growing faster over the past 10 years than most of the rest of the country. Almost all of that growth was from the Latino population in Texas. Put a pin in that, right? So as a result of growing more than its neighbors over the past 10 years, 
apportionment of congressional seats pursuant to that 2020 census will give Texas two new U.S. congressional districts, right? So they will go from having 36 seats in the House to having 38 seats in the House. And again, that growth almost entirely on the back of the Latino population of Texas, such that Anglos, non-Latino whites, are now less than 40% of the state population, and Latinos are or soon will be the single largest ethnic group in Texas, right? So it will be a majority-minority state. You would not think a majority-minority state would be overwhelmingly set up to elect white people to Congress, but that is because you are not the redistricting committee of the state of Texas. The Texas state legislature's plan will take those two new seats, right, fueled by Latino growth, and make them white seats in Congress. Yeah, and we should be clear about why Republicans are are talking about this in terms of non-Latino whites v. everyone else. Because non-Latino white people is a reliable proxy for Republican voter. Yeah. And, and here's where it gets tricky. My understanding is that after the Supreme Court's holding in Rucho v. Common Cause last year, the Supreme Court has held unambiguously that it is perfectly fine for a partisan state legislature as part of partisan redistricting to intend to and to actually carry out gerrymandering, no matter how ridiculous, if the goal is to benefit your political party and not your race which means the racists can just use Democrats when they're drawing districts, right? Yeah, so I, I, I agree with that analysis. I share your pessimistic view of Rucho, right? Like, that was a terrible decision that you have correctly summarized. Um, and and uh, before we talk about how this case is, is organized, um, I want to point out there are two other super bad cases out of our right-wing Supreme Court that, you know, form a, a trifecta of awful here, right? The first, as as we all know, 2013's Shelby County versus Holder, that eliminated the preclearance requirement on southern states before they could enact new voter suppression laws. And that's why, hmm, shockingly, as soon as it was gone, a bunch of southern states enacted a whole bunch of new voter suppression laws. Right? Mm. Um, that that left Section five of the Voting Rights Act essentially unenforceable. Yeah. And then the third case we need to talk about is Brnovich versus DNC. That was mm. the Arizona case we talked about here on your show, on my show, um, that upheld uh, a set of laws that were designed. The, the, the principal effect was to make it easier uh, to throw out provisional ballots that just so happened to be overwhelmingly minority and overwhelmingly Democratic based on some stupid technical rules that that don't happen in most states. Right. So in other words. If you cast a provisional ballot and it was later determined that that you cast it at the wrong precinct, even if it was for races that you were other, otherwise eligible to vote for, they can throw it out. Um, and so uh, and the Supreme Court was like, yeah, psh, uh, voter integrity, voter fraud that doesn't exist. Right. Like it it, it was a six three decision. Um, the landscape is pretty bleak. Yeah, yeah. And as Merrick Garland said today in that press conference, you know, if we if we had those preclearance rules, Section 5 in place, we wouldn't be here today because now the Department of Justice has to proactively go out and find voter suppression and stop it. And this particular lawsuit, um, I think, is about Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which is still in force. Right. And and if I recall, it has sometimes uh, an unlikely ally in Clarence Thomas. That that is that is true. I mean, Clarence Thomas has joined with um, not. <laughs> I should say all of these decisions predate Trump uh, and predate sort of the you know permanent howler monkey takeover of the right wing. Uh, but if you are looking ahead to uh, eventually this lawsuit reaching the Supreme Court and saying, can you piece together? Can you cobble together five justices? to vote to overturn uh, these districts, um, you you get the three sane justices. Uh, maybe uh, you get John Roberts, although John Roberts has not been a good vote on gerrymandering cases. He, he voted with the majority in uh, both Rucho and uh, Brnovich. Uh, and maybe you get Clarence Thomas. Look, I, I'm not going to tell you it's not a huge uphill battle, uh, but that's sort of how you piece the puzzle together in the long run. But let's talk a little bit about Section 2, because you are absolutely correct. Um, Section five was preclearance. Section two requires that state voting laws, including laws that draw or redraw electoral maps, 
provide eligible voters with an equal opportunity to participate in the democratic process and to elect representatives of their choosing. And the key test here uh, is whether there is vote dilution of an identifiable minority group. Um, And so to figure that out, a little over three months ago, Merrick Garland's DOJ promulgated new, if non-binding, guidance to states as to how to draw congressional districts consistent with Section 2 of the VRA, guidance that, of course, Texas ignored. <laughs> yeah, of course. And and uh, something else Garland said today, he said, the complaint we filed today alleges that Texas has violated Section 2 by creating redistricting plans that deny or abridge the rights of Latino and black voters to vote on account of their race, color, or membership in a language minority group. And and the argument is that it both has discriminatory purpose as well as the discriminatory impact of minimizing the voting strength, vote dilution, like you said, of minority communities. Yep, that's exactly right. It's a it's a well written lawsuit. Um, the complaint tracks the seminal Supreme Court case on uh, VRA Section Two, which is a case called Thornburg versus Gingles, four seventy eight U S thirty. Um, that's a nineteen eighty six case. That was about this voter dilution, right? And 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 basically, there's a two-step process, right? First, you gatekeep. You figure out under a three-part test as part one. I know lawyers are like this, right? Um, first, you determine whether the district uh, uh, qualifies at all. This is the gatekeeping. Uh, those three factors are A, you must have a sufficiently large minority group that is geographically compact within a single district. Right? Check. B, that group must be politically cohesive. Check. And C, the new redistricting must make it possible for the majority, if they vote as a block, and and here's the precise language of the case, quote, usually to defeat the minority group's preferred candidate, end of quote. Yeah. And, and, and I will say all of the districts here seem to meet that standard. So, so they qualify under Section 2. And then you look to the next part of the inquiry, which is um, a seven plus factor balancing test. But basically, it looks at the effect of the redistricting in totality uh, in light of the history of that district. Um, Mm. And so, you know, it's a very fact specific inquiry. Yeah. And it looks like a really solid case Um, in the Dallas Fort Worth districts. For example, the new Texas redistricting plan breaks up minority communities and sticks them in a bunch of districts some of which are more than 100 miles away yeah, uh, and all of which are Anglo, meaning that the minority vote gets broken up and diluted amongst a sea of white voters. Yeah, that's right. So this model, it was pioneered by the late and evil <laughs> Thomas Hofeller. Whom, Dr. You know, Hofar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, we've talked about, I, I've come on a guest on your show to, to talk about mm-hmm. Hofeller. Um, thank you, boy, you know, th- Thank whatever God you believe in for his daughter who went uh, Mm -hmm. searching through his files after he's dead. Um, By the way, Alex, if you're listening to the show, do not go searching through my hard drives after I'm dead. (laughs) Anyway, um, uh, and she found the, uh, you know, ways to benefit non uh, non non-Hispanic whites. Um, And the principal way in which Hofeller has been doing had been doing this for two decades uh, was a technique called packing and cracking. We've talked about this before. The idea is you take a large minority group and you do two things. First, you stick them in a small number of, of districts where they can overdetermine the outcome. And that's why you, you will see when you watch election returns, right, uh, in in these states, all of a sudden you will see like one Democrat get elected 89 to four, right? Because they will get stuck into a district with 80 and 90 percent margins. That's the packing. And then you take all of the rest and you submerge them in a sea of white people so that the surrounding districts are reliably like nine to 10 points, 55 to 45, 54 to 46. You know, the, that's really the sweet spot uh, in the program um, are reliably white and Republican. That's the cracking. And it's why it, it isn't just that you look down at a gerrymandered district and you see like, thin lines that run along a highway and have no voters in them. Like the reason for doing that is, is because that, that, that first prong, right? Like minorities tend to live in geographically compact and identifiable areas. And you need to get them out of those areas and into white districts, majority white rural districts that are a hundred miles away. Yeah. So you want to segregate them physically and then draw tiny lines around them to 
exactly to dilute their votes. And and this is also where the fight over the census citizenship question comes in, right? Because you yep. can you can divide districts by voting age population VAP and CVAP citizens <laughs> citizen voting age population. And that's what happened in District 23. On the basis of their best estimates, even though District 23 will be over 62% Latino, many of those will be ineligible to vote because areas with high Latino CVAP were gerrymandered out into white districts. And the result is what you see, a district that's almost two-thirds Latino, but as paragraph 50 says, in District 23, block voting by Anglo voters will enable them to usually defeat Latino voters' preferred candidates. Yeah, and and this is something, I'm I'm glad we're talking about it because it is a a knock-on of the pernicious effects of Trump's politicization of the census. Um, Everybody covered this as, hey, he tried to add a citizenship question to the census in order to deter non-citizens from answering, which is true. And we got rescued by the Supreme Court, which, you know, (laughs) sort of just barely by the skin of our teeth. And again, thanks to Dr. Hofeller's daughter. Um, But but that that didn't really touch at the data collecting that went on beneath the surface. Right. Like, so, yeah. The big point was deter Latinos from answering the census. But the granularity of the data they collected, right, like the racist instructions that still went back and forth, enabled them to do things like in Texas, look at an area and go, hey, where's an area that has a huge population, right, which is how we draw our districts. But we think uh, that's the VAP, uh, but we think comparatively lower CVAP, citizen voting age population, right? So that we can have, you know, this situation where you have a super majority uh, of Latino voters, but you feel pretty good uh, that uh, that you've managed to put eligible Latino voters, that is those that meet the citizenship requirements, uh, out into any of these nine districts where uh, they are diluted and cracked. And um, it's uh, it's pretty pernicious. It's pretty ugly. And uh, and these cases take, you know, sort of a while to gather the factual record. So um, so I think we're going to learn even more. This is this is just what the DOJ knows now. Um, and and uh, they're going to learn more over the course of the next couple of months. Yeah. And, and it's even frightening to think of how many uh, people were chilled from answering the, the census and filling out the census form and, and how actually more Latino majority these areas yep. probably are. Yep, Absol- absolutely. That that is that is the 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 pernicious effect of the story circulating. Yeah. Right. You know, is is a self fulfilling prophecy. So yeah, it's um, uh, don't elect racists, people. Mm, yeah, there you go. Uh, or you know, if you can help it because you're so damn gerrymandered. <laughs> yeah. Right. I I shouldn't laugh at that. That's that's. I mean, it, it is pernicious. It's horrible, and it's it's why we need to codify voting rights. Um. And and row. I mean, we really should just have a filibuster carve out for for these things for for constitutional rights. Um, and I'm not sure why that's not happening. Anyway, uh, we do have uh, more. F- the The second block after this break coming up is so much more fun. <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, and so uh, stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody, it's Allison Gill, the host formerly known as AG. Today's Cleanup on All 45 is brought to you by Feels CBD. As you know, CBD isn't about what you feel. It's about what you don't feel. You would not feel stress, anxiety, or pain. And keeping a clear head and feeling great is easy with Feels. No hangovers or addictions. If you haven't tried CBD, I highly recommend it. Feels CBD is safe and organic and has helped me sleep better. It's reduced my anxiety and it's lessened my soreness and pain, especially after workouts. Just put a few drops of Feels under your tongue and feel the difference within minutes. I feel calmer. My muscles are less sore after the workouts, like I said, and my mood is lifted and I can fall asleep more easily at night, which is nice. Deliveries are hassle-free and delivered directly to your door without a prescription necessary. You can call their free CBD hotline. This thing is amazing. They help you find the right CBD dose for you. I love that I can call somebody for that. And the Feels Monthly Membership makes self-care simple. You'll save money on every order and you can pause or cancel anytime. It's real easy. So start feeling better with Feels. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash cleanup and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That's huge. That's feels, F-E-A-L-S dot com slash cleanup to become a member and get 50% 
automatically taken off your first order with free shipping included. Again, feels.com slash cleanup. You'll be glad you did. Everybody, welcome back. United States District Court, Eastern District of Michigan, Southern Division, Timothy King and the rest, plaintiffs v. Gretchen Whitmer and the rest, City of Detroit, Democratic National Committee, Michigan's Democratic Party, and Robert Davis. Opinion and order. What do we have here today? <laughs> One of my favorite, uh, you know, new rock stars uh, that I've been following, Judge Linda Parker. Uh, we... Um, we watched these sanction hearings live, and uh, and she was just masterful in dissecting, you know, what was a room full of obfuscation. Yeah, um, and then you and I did a live show from the Hay Adams across the street from the White House. Zelensky was in the house. <laughs> was, there were, everything about that live show was fantastic. And, and yeah, um, we had a bunch of great patrons. That's another perk of being a patron. You can come see us live when we're out and about was so much fun and what yep. very, very powerful, interesting, wonderful questions, great dialogue. And then we had great cocktails after uh, and uh, it was just a totally memorable time. And, and I'm glad that we covered that sanctions hearing because it is so fresh now still in my memory, <laughs> despite the cocktails. Um, but, you know, that really kind of put a spotlight on that for me. And I've been waiting to see. Now, we did have uh, some decisions and, and now this is kind of an additional decision. Why, why don't you talk about sort of where we are in the process? Yeah. So at our live show, we broke down the glorious 110 page opinion and order from August 25th uh, from Judge Parker that uh, that that cut through the bullshit and said, um, you know, from the opening paragraph, this lawsuit represents a historic and profound abuse of the judicial process. And so as a result, uh, ordered uh, sanctions in a variety of ways against each and every one of the Kraken lawyers that came before her peddling this nonsense uh, pursuant to uh, particular rules of civil procedure, but also pursuant to the court's inherent authority uh, to sanction bad faith conduct by litigants before it, right? So uh, multiple levels of authority. One of the things that, uh, and, and we are waiting, by the way, uh, uh, one of the things I was happiest about in that August 25th order was uh, the referral out of each and every one of these lawyers from for, for, for potential disbarment proceedings from their home jurisdictions, right? Um, uh, and there was a November 4th meeting. Yep. in Texas for the uh, con to consider the disbarment or suspension of the law license of one Sidney Powell, who we just learned this past week is now under federal mm. criminal investigation yeah. for her PACs that she fundraised for her Kraken Strike Force lawsuits. Um, yeah. so uh, on the other hand, <laughs> we learned that she raised $14 million off the backs of gullible Trump supporters. So, you know, it's it's. Uh, I will I will not be satisfied until Sidney Powell is, you know, huddling outside the barrel a la, you know, Randolph and Mortimer at the beginning of coming to America. But uh, yeah, or in, in prison is good too. <laughs> prison is real good. Um, so because uh, apparently she put two people on her board of directors of her pack, her 501c4 without their permission, Lynn Wood and, and some guy named Castleberry. And, and and also involved with that was uh, Little Miss It's My First Day, Emily Newman, who <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we learned far from it being, you know, you're just some like random contract worker who happened to show up. No, Emily Newman uh, uh, inextricably linked with all of these uh, uh, serpents and vipers. So, all right. Um, the other thing uh, that was pretty significant is that that order uh, was going to order the Kraken lawyers to pay uh the legal fees of the state of Michigan and the city of Detroit. And um, that order is joint and several. That means that you can go get it out of any one of them, including Emily Newman, including Stephanie Lynn Gentilla, any single one, uh, and then force them uh, to, you know, bicker amongst themselves how to allocate it, which uh, I love because the, the idea of, uh, you know, breaking up this, uh, you know, I mean, that's how that's how you defeated the Kraken, right? Like you, you, you got to cut off the heads and then, you know, uh, uh, you know, use use flame to to cauterize the wound. I don't, I don't. It's been a long time since I've had mythology. Anyway, um, that's what this order is about. This order is about computing the 
legal fees that are owed uh, pursuant to that opinion and order. Um, and it it is uh, delightful. Yeah, as The Daily Show says, find people on both sides. Yeah, nice. nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so looking at this order here, what are some of the uh, the standout moments uh, for you in, in this? Because I know that they're, at one point they they did um, the the defendants filed documentation requesting twenty one thousand twenty two thousand almost, um, which uh, uh, you know reflects the work of Heather Meingast and Eric Grill, both employed by the Michigan Attorney General's office, and so they logged their hours and stuff, and then they go through that, and then also the city filed documentation asking for one hundred and eighty two thousand, a little more than that, and that's comprised of. Forty grand for work defending the action. Twenty, and they break it all down. Yeah. Uh, but I think one of the amounts was lowered by a, a little bit at requ- at the request of of the Kraken. Is that correct? Yeah. So let's. So there's a lot there. Let's unpack all of it. Remember that um, there are essentially uh, three different parties here uh, that um, applied for relief. Um, the first was Gretchen Whitmer and the state of Michigan. Uh, the second was the city of Detroit. That's who hired David Fink, uh, the brilliant lawyer who who did the who had the laboring or right, like who did all the work uh, in connection with the sanctions hearing and and most of the work uh, on the the merits or lack thereof of the underlying litigation. The third was Robert Davis at the and the court denied relief with respect to Davis. Right. It said uh, you didn't do anything. You just kind of piggybacked on the work that the city and the state were doing. So um, you get nothing. And uh, and and that was a function of, um, you know, their their participation in the case. And it pointed out that, like, you know, the only things that Davis filed uh, were filed incorrectly and, you know, didn't advance the ball in the litigation. And look. We all know who's doing the work here. It's it's Fink doing the work. So y- you are correct that that's the reason for the breakdown on the numbers here. It is the city says, OK, we're owed one hundred and eighty two grand. Uh, the state says we're owed about twenty two grand. Um, and it does get reduced. The, the, the single everything else is normal nitpicking of, of a type that I'm about to discuss. Mm. Um, but the but the one area that. Um, uh, where the Kraken lawyers can can claim they won a victory um, has to do with uh, the city of Detroit submitting for reimbursement attorneys fees spent on uh, the appeal, right, that was prepared by Stephanie Lynn Gentilla uh, up to the Seventh Circuit, uh, up, sorry, up to the Sixth Circuit. Uh, and um, And that turned out to be twenty six thousand dollars right and um and the court said made it very very clear um no no matter the the broad language that i used in my order um i did not uh intend for you to be able to recover the fees awarded to the appeal not because the appeal was not also frivolous and and to the extent that judge parker can say that the appeal was frivolous She's made that very clear, right? Like it's a yeah. nonsense lawsuit, right? The appeal, you know, you don't often get a meritorious appeal from a nonsense lawsuit, right? So what's um, the grounds for not having to pay that particular fee? So the the grounds are that um, that the district court really loses jurisdiction over the case the minute that it goes up on appeal. And so, for example, like the case law from the Supreme Court is super duper clear. It's a case called Cooter and Gel versus Hartmarks. Um, look, cool, I love that. Yeah, that's a cool from 1990, one. that says um, you cannot uh, you cannot recover Rule 11 sanctions in a, a district court for the amounts incurred on appeal. If you have a bogus appeal, you've got to go to the appellate court and say, "Hey, this was a bogus appeal," and the appellate court has to agree with you uh, on that award for sanctions. And and the timing for that has passed. So so anticipating your question of. Could they go to uh, the Sixth Circuit and and seek an order? Probably not, right? Like I think I think the time for doing so has passed. Um, right. So, so City of Detroit included twenty six thousand for the work they spent on the appeal, and the court. Um, you again, you could view this as a as a victory for the Kraken lawyers, 
Or you could also view it as the way I do, which is that this court is making sure Mm -hmm. that its order is bulletproof right here, right? Yeah, they also, I think, pulled out another two hours from David Fink, uh, (laughs) right? Because he billed for review and response to media inquiries, but the city filed its motion for sanctions, and there was really nothing to do but wait for the court's decision. So the court said, we're not going to grant you those two hours either. Yeah, um, <laughs> this is really funny. Uh, well, it's funny to me as a lawyer, and <laughs> and it is. In, in, we we lead terrible, pathetic lives. Uh, this is what as um, the, the, Did you the, hear the one about Fink's two hours? At the yeah, <laughs> oh, that's that a real one. rib tickler. <laughs> um, but but it 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 shows you the way in which these cases play out, right? Which is. When a court awards attorney's fees, whether uh, due to a statute or fee shifting or here because of sanctions, what you do is you then submit all your bills, right? And you say to the court, okay, well, here's what our attorney's fees are. You black out any, um, uh, you know, attorney client privileged information that's on the bills uh, and, and then you submit it to the court and the court takes a look at it. Um, and the other side gets to take a look at it. And uh, that's why you, you know, black out anything that is. Uh, responsive attorney client, you know, that that would be attorney client privilege. Um, And then the other side gets to kind of go line by line and nitpick everything that you've done on your bills. Right. Um, And And how much does that cost? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. Well, look, these people are all grifting from each other. So who the hell knows? Right. Like, (laughs) I I mean, at the end of the day, you know, like it, it feels like there's sort of a giant slush fund and like, you know, you just kind of dip in and take what you want. But I, I am sure that the uh, the Kraken lawyers are not operating on a, uh, you know, communist or socialist distribution of their money. Uh, so. So, yeah, like they spent a lot of money paying Howard Kleinhandler to write uh, the opposition in which he goes line by line and is like, hey, uh, this this amount is inappropriate because uh, it is uh, what we call block billing, right? And block billing is just when you say, oh, I've billed eight hours spent on X case, right? It doesn't have a specific breakdown. Usually what you have to do in order to to recover is uh, your time entries have to say the, the matter that you've worked on, right? Um, so, you know, drafting and you know drafting a a motion to dismiss. That may take you way more than eight hours, but you've got to say, right, I spent 11.2 hours drafting a motion to dismiss. Court will uphold that 100 times out of 100. But if you just say worked on Whitmer matter 8.0, a court will say, yeah, that's block billing. It's not specific enough. And they threw out like $87 for block billing, right? <laughs> like a, a truly insignificant amount. And as you pointed out, um, there there is a, a, a delightful section beginning on page 15 Um, in which uh, the court says an attorney's review of a motion in court order, even if it's only a text only order, does not necessarily describe only reading it. The court does not find the time billed on December one, which was a half hour build for review of a motion in court order to be excessive. Right. So so, (laughs) you know, like here was the argument. They were like, come on, man. It did not take. (laughs) That whole excessive billing section of Miss Newman takes issue with this, and the yeah. court's like, and you're dumb. And yeah. then Miss Newman takes issue with this, and we're like, yeah, no, again, you're dumb. Like, they, she just totally <laughs> throws it all right back at M- Newman. And uh, and I'm just going to say it that way from now on. Newman objects to 40.5 hours billed. Nope, that's not excessive. Newman contends a billed by the city. <laughs> nope, no, again. You take Newman takes issues with the 82 hours of the city attorney. I think my favorite was um, the nor does the court find the 114 hours billed by the city from the date of the hearing excessive. Newman attributes all these hours to the city's preparation of briefs. But again, the docket reflects more activity after the hearing than that. For example, plaintiff's attorney L. Lynn Wood had posted a video from the hearing on social media in violation of the court's local rules leading to the filing of an emergency motion and a show cause order issued by the court yeah, plaintiff's, we talked about that. <laughs> plaintiff's attorney filed an emergency motion asking the court to publicly release the video moreover plaintiff's attorney raised many arguments for the first time in july 12th hearing in response to the motions 
There was a bunch of stupid shit that you did that they had to respond to. So no, that's not excessive billing. It, it, this is why, right? What we're seeing here, like it's delightful that it is happening against bad people who tried to overthrow our democracy, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but what we're seeing is perfectly routine in the context of stuff that is not routine, right? Like so so it is not routine for a, for a court to grant sanctions. Um, I have had those granted against civil litigants twice in, in my career, and I've been practicing for 20 years, right? Um, so uh, not common, uh, but it, it shows what a powerful club sanctions are once the court uh, has suggested that they take them seriously or, uh, in, you know, in this case, has, has actually uh, awarded them. And it, it, is, it, it is part of why it is shocking that um, that these lawyers didn't take it seriously at a time when they had a chance to back out, you know? Um, so, you know, one of the things that we talked about at the, uh, at, at the, uh, July hearing, um, that, you know, we covered it, <laughs> it, you know, wall to wall. I watched, you know, it was one, one of the most entertaining things I saw on television all year. Right. Um, it, it, it is the safe Harbor provisions of rule 11, right? Rule 11 um, requires you to tell the other side, hey, man, I think this violates Rule 11, right? I think this is sanctionable conduct, uh, and I intend to go to the court and get relief if you don't withdraw this. And then you have to give them 21 days, right? You have to give them three full weeks. That's the safe harbor. And if they withdraw that objectionable pleading during the 21 days, you get nothing. Right. Like the, the, the idea is to to minimize this day of reckoning. And so I think it's really, really important to emphasize um, as, as people are trying to figure this out, that um, these are truly extraordinary circumstances. Right. Like our legal system is set up such that um, to, to to avoid being in the spot, you only get to the spot when you are evil and stupid and wrong and you won't back down. <laughs> yeah, and that's a perfect way to describe the Kraken Strike, the Kraken Strike Force, the Kraken Strike Force. <laughs> As uh, <laughs> I'm doing my dad's spoonerisms, pardon me. I love it. I love um, it. And yeah, and and congratulations again to Sidney Powell at all for their their federal investigation. You've made it, baby. Uh, and you know, and what's cool, what's cool, Andrew, is that that grand jury was impaneled at least three months ago. Mm -hmm. We didn't hear a peep about it until somebody who testified to the grand jury, probably that Castleberry guy or or that Brendan fella, came, told somebody about it. I think it was Murray Wass that they, that they told about it at The Guardian. Um, and that's how investigations work, right? It's quiet, quiet, quiet until you get to the, to, to the loud people. <laughs> right. Uh, and you I, save the loud people for last, uh, and and that's that's sort of how it goes. But I I think it's and also we we learned in when that story came out that Garland put Molly Gaston in charge of quote unquote politically charged investigations, criminal investigations surrounding January sixth, and yep. she's got her own little grand jury going there in the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. And um and it's been there for at least three months. And and this subpoena looks like it could be part of a larger investigation uh because she's on it molly you don't put molly guest on on you know small <laughs> shit nope so uh very very interesting very informative and and i hope that um we see some indictments uh coming out of there i i i sh share and endorse all of that right like and 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 let's you know say the quiet part loud right which is a lot of our listeners and i and i share that i know you share it are you know frustrated at you know, where is, uh, you know, where is the New York attorney general's office on this? Where is the status of, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Georgia investigations that we've talked about? Where's Tish James, right? And where is the DOJ on, uh, Trump's crimes, uh, federal crimes for which he did not self pardon. Um, those are valid questions. Uh, but, but silence is not necessarily the answer that you think it is. It, it, it could be, mm. right? We don't know. And, and so it is valid to be frustrated and it is valid to say that we don't know. It is not valid to go the next step where, you know, uh, folks are saying that, uh, you know, Merrick Garland is, you know, 
installed by and, Mitch McConnell to protect uh, Trump or it, something. It, you know, yeah. what a load of horseshit. I mean, it, it. I had somebody the other day say, you know, Merrick Garland is a member of the Federalist Society. Let's if you've ever heard that, by the way, uh, that is unequivocally false. Mm-hmm. Merrick Garland has moderated debates sponsored by the Federalist Society, which, by the way, if participating in a debate in which the Federalist Society is a participant uh, makes you a member of the Federalist Society, then congratulations, I'm a member of the Federalist Society. Yeah, congratulations. So is Justice Breyer, Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They've all moderated these panels. It it, it Um, is just people looking, right? Like, that the, the reality is the way we describe it. Like, look, would I have loved to have had a 32 year old, like lesbian black woman bomb throw? You know, yes. As attorney general. Yes. A hundred percent. That would be better than, you know, old white dude, Merrick Garland. Uh, no question. Uh, but, um, but let's not, you know, take uh, silence as meaning nothing. Um, and, and I think you made a really excellent point on that. Thanks. Yeah, it it is frustrating. It is. Um, But I'm I sort of am looking at it from this 30,000 foot view, uh, the way that a lot of people felt about Watergate. A lot of people were very impatient about Watergate. It it took 13 months to get public testimony. It's going to take 13 months, oddly, to get public testimony in the January 6th committee from the time of the crime. Uh, Exactly 13 months. And then the next summer, uh, indictments rained down, and the year after that, we got all the convictions. Uh, so uh, obviously not of Nixon, because Nixon resigned in order to, to and and then was pardoned. <laughs> yeah, and then was pardoned. Uh, so anyway, um, keep the faith, I guess. Uh, and and I tell you what, if if we find out there's a declination to look at obstruction of justice in the Mueller, we find out there's a declination to look at Trump for the coup. Uh, and his involvement with Eastman and Ellis and Clark, uh, I will be, be there. <laughs> pissed. Uh, but I'm waiting for those declinations. In the meantime, Look, I don't want to try to tear down the Department of Justice because that's what the Republicans want. Let's and 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 let's say we have put our money where the mouth is, right? Like we, you and I said in November, uh, if the DOJ did not issue an indictment of Steve Bannon, that uh, you know that that would be gross dereliction of duty. I said I would call for Merrick Garland to resign. Yep. Um, and and guess what they did? <laughs> yeah, a week after the brand new, the brand spanking new yeah. DC U.S. attorney got there. So you know, it, it's it's a way of saying we say this. I feel like we say it every week. Um, you know, it, it 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 you know where we're coming from. Uh, you know that we are not uh, unambiguous apologists for the Biden administration. Uh, but you also know that, you know, it's important to 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 put stuff in context and understand, you know, where where the administration is coming from. And, you know, the the <laughs> the, the things that are disappointing now, uh, you know, uh, uh, go back and listen to the archives of our respective shows <laughs> from 2017 <laughs> to 2020. If you want a remembrance of uh, how bad it can get. Mm. Yeah, you try walking around Twitter with a name like Mueller, she wrote. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we'll be right back with our favorite block, comings and goings. Uh, Stay with us. We'll be right back. I'm Greg Oliar. Four years ago, I stopped writing novels to report on the crimes of Donald Trump and his associates. In 2018, I wrote a best-selling book about it, Dirty Rubles. In 2019, I launched Prevail, a bi-weekly column about Trump and Putin spies and mobsters, and so many traitors! Trump may be gone, but the damage he wrought will take years to fully understand. Join me and a revolving crew of contributors and guests as we try to make sense of it all. This is Prevail. Everybody, welcome back. Before we get to the comings and goings, I have a little cleanup news here. Uh, Andrew, remember the all-out assault on inspectors general by the Trump administration? I do. Yeah. Well, the Biden administration plans to issue new directives to federal agencies Friday. This is passed this past Friday to increase cooperation with government watchdogs, calling it a critical step to, quote, build public confidence in government as it aims to spend trillions of dollars on new programs. We're talking about Build Back Better, American Jobs, American Rescue Plan. Yep. Uh, So this is this is music to my ears. 
I yeah, mine too. So uh, let's lay the landscape a little bit. The offices of inspectors general are scattered across government agencies. They are supposed to act, historically have acted as independent oversight offices. They are going after fraud, waste, and abuse. You hear that all the time in their respective agencies. But a new memo from OMB cites a recent internal review that found that many agencies were not, quote, sufficiently encouraging staff members to cooperate with IGs. Wonder how that happened. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know anything about this one. I do. Uh, So even (laughs) as the White House is still working to nominate and confirm new inspectors general at a dozen departments and agencies, including replacing several dismissed by former President Trump, the memo recommends (laughs) the memo. This is a great memo. Yeah. Uh, with the TPS reports. Uh, no, the memo recommends proactive steps to seek and incorporate their oversight, like proactively. Mm-hmm. And, and here's a quote from the acting director of OMB, Shalanda Young. She says, as President Biden has made clear, results and accountability go hand in hand to deliver results for all Americans now and in the years to come. The federal government must undertake its work and support appropriate oversight of its activities in a manner deserving of public trust. Yeah, many of the steps called for in the memo mirror those the administration has taken in implementing the American Rescue Plan, right? That is the $1.9 trillion COVID-19 relief bill that Biden signed into law way back in March. Remember that? I do. Uh, Gene Sperling, the White House's American Rescue Plan coordinator, said that the oversight is also modeled on how Biden worked to ensure that the stimulus money approved during the Obama administration was spent properly. And I should add, they have the benefit of uh, House uh, oversight committees, uh, including one, a subcommittee led by uh, Raja Krishnamurthy, uh, that found, of course, that the Trump era disbursements were just rife with uh, with fraud, uh, with, you know, inappropriate uh, recipients and, and the like. So, um, you know, it's 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 a cross utilization of the knowledge in that area to uh, that knowledge in the IG area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And fo- and following the advice of the president, Sperling met with all 19 inspectors general who serve on the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee. Uh, and they, he did that in his first week as coordinator. And he has had weekly meetings with its leadership since. Yeah, I'm sure that's uh, new after the Trump administration. <laughs> he will address all 46 inspectors general involved in pandemic related spending this month. He said, my view is that you want to get their advice early. And if something is going wrong, you want to be the first to know. What I'm interested in, as you can imagine, Andrew, is whistleblowers. Does this do anything to address whistleblower protection? Yeah. So, well, so this directive um, also calls on agencies to implement best practices across the federal government to to protect whistleblowers. Right. And the deputy director of OMB, Jason Miller, not that Jason Miller, said (laughs) one of his first jobs was to rebuild and repair relationships between agencies and their inspectors general after the Trump administration. So although inspectors general are meant to be independent auditors, Trump, as we all know, increasingly took aim at some late in his administration uh, and removed or replaced four IGs in two months. That is unprecedented. Big ones, Uh, too. uh, Yeah, well, his dismissal of the intelligence community's inspector general was what triggered the first impeachment over Ukraine. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. All right. Well, that's cool. All right. So now yep. I, I'm very happy about this because you know, the, I worked at the VA for a long time and that the whistleblower and accountability office just went to shit uh, yep. under Trump. And anyway, I'm, I'm glad that, that they're doing something. But, and I knew they would. It's just nice to read about it. <laughs> I, I agree. I thought you were saying you were excited about our, our coming, our, our, our kind of bittersweet comings and goings. And you'll you'll see why in a minute, because. Right wing lunatic, grifter extraordinaire, and the only sitting congressman to ever lose, sue, and lose a, a lawsuit versus a fictional internet cow. The man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Devin Nunes is retiring from Congress. Dun da da da. He's leaving Congress to take over as CEO of Trump's new social media startup, which supposedly branded Truth Social, but it's formally called the Trump Media and Technology Group, TMTG. And what do you know? The literal day in which it's announced that Truth Social will be run by the sleaziest member of Congress 
we have a surely unrelated announcement <laughs> that the Trump Media and Technology Group is subject to two separate investigations by both the Securities Exchange Commission and the Financial Regulatory Authority. And we oh, know what a thunk it. <laughs> a couple of weeks, our girl, Liz Warren, asked the SEC to look into this. And yep. uh, and dreams come true on the day oh. Devin announces his resignation. Oh, God. All right. So here's kind of the background. Trump formed an entity to acquire his social media company for the purposes of both securing private investors and also being able to take the company public, to, to publicly trade it on the New York Stock Exchange, right? So that entity is called a special purpose acquisition company. I found or my special spec. purpose. <laughs> and, um, and because it's publicly traded, so the idea is the SPAC is publicly traded and then it merges with, acquires the assets uh, of the company that you want to take public and you don't have to go through kind of the IPO process, right? So, um, but because the SPAC is, is publicly traded, it has to make public disclosures to comply with federal law. One of those is called a Form 8K. And in that, um, at the very end, you have to list material contingencies. And the 8K revealed uh, that uh, that entity was the subject of multiple requests for information regarding board meetings, internal policies, the identities of its investors. And, and this is really, I think, if there's a smoking gun, uh, where it will be, the details of communications between that entity and the Trump firm, uh, all of those could be violations of federal securities laws. <laughs> yeah. And, and Trump said that the SPAC had reached agreements to obtain a billion dollars in capital from what it calls, <laughs> quote, a diverse group of institutional investors, which is a truly impressive level of grift, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the documents are preliminary to any findings by either the SEC or FERNA. So, and that's the Financial Regulatory Authority, right? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's obviously uh, the, the, the SPAC, you know, uh, today uh, was emphasizing that, you know, well, no determination has been made by, by either of these regulatory bodies. But of course not, because these are the preliminary inquiries. <laughs> you get the documents, you look at them, or they refuse to turn over certain documents. That This is the start of the process, right? So, the question, or one of many questions being asked by ah, our unrequited crush, Liz Warren, is whether the SPAC held private conversations about the acquisition and failed to disclose those conversations in its SEC filings or other public statements that would have the potential to manipulate the stock price to keep it artificially low. And that is a crime. Mm, crime. And what do you want to bet they obstruct justice? Just to throw I, it out. I mean, you know, the, the, you got to go by track records. So yeah. uh, these are squeaky clean folks who would never you know, <laughs> manipulate the stock price to get a billion dollars from idiots who think that the election was stolen by voting machines on the back of a, you know, documentary put together by a coked up pillow manufacturer. <laughs> coked Sorry. up pillow man. <laughs> All right. Nunez is out. Okay, farewell to Moonez. <laughs> Moo. <laughs> But <laughs> by Devin, oh. and maybe you take a midnight Uber over to the White House and <laughs> withdraw your. <laughs> oh, that's uh. right. Donald's not there anymore. Ah, maybe you take a midnight Uber down to Mar-a-Lago then. Uh, may I never see the uh, like low shot. He he employed like I don't know, Lenny Reifenstahl or whatever to like follow him around and do those like low shots from the trolley at like a foot up so that. You know, they're they're designed to, like, make you look majestic and sweeping. But on Devin Nunes, it just looks like, you know, you're uh, you've handed your camcorder over to a four year old. But, <laughs> oh, God, that guy. Jail is almost too good for Devin Nunes. Notice I have said almost. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, and then, you know, what's weird, too. He's given up, a, you know, if the House takes over in 2022, if the Republicans take over the House. He'd be head of what? Ways and means, I think. House Ways and Means. Like, yeah, I, it suggests A, that there is a rather large potential for grift coming, mm. and B, that, you know, uh, among people trying to make predictions, right? Like, Republican retirements still way outnumber Democratic retirements, right? So if you're on team, uh, you know, the, the, the 2021 elections means that, you know, we are doomed to lose the House and the Senate in 2022. This is 
This is some evidence to the contrary. Should not be complacent. We got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of organizing to do. I want to fly Stacey Abrams everywhere in the country and clone <laughs> her. And, you know, uh, but um, uh, but 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 I think it's not a foregone conclusion. I hope it's not because, you know, I. I I kind of like this country. <laughs> no, yeah, and and we have a very different set of circumstances than the normal uh, election, midterm election after an incumbent uh, victory, yep. uh, ch- you know, changes hands uh, after the White House changes hands, and that is that next summer we should be getting that uh, decision from the Supreme Court on the Mississippi abortion ban, in which best case scenario they gut they gut Roe, and worst case scenario they overturn it completely. Um, which you and I talked about, and and that is handing the baton of women's health care over to Democrats for the first time in five decades, four decades, five decades. Well, I, I if if what happened last week does not motivate you uh, to get out and um, and and vote Democratic, uh, I, I I don't know what what will. No. Certainly, certainly not this show. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure we're we're dialed in with everybody listening, but um, it's it's frightening. It's fr- it's it's frightening, especially since every single one of those SCOTUS justices said that Roe was settled law in their confirmation hearing. So. That, that- I have I have many, many thoughts. Uh, there was a long, ranty, almost two hour opening arguments last Thursday, uh, last Friday, uh, uh, episode 548. Um, and uh, I could have gone another another five or six. Mm. Uh, but certainly um, the 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 confirmation process is is uh, is broken. The the only person who made any effort to obfuscate was hilariously enough, Clarence Thomas, uh, who nevertheless perjured himself. I went back and reviewed uh, his confirmation testimony when uh, when asked about Roe, uh, which was decided while he was in law school. Um, he uh, he said, well, actually, we were much more interested with discussing Griswold at the time, <laughs> um, uh, which uh, that's not true. Uh, that's that's a hundred. Pr- right. Right. Uh, it's clearly perjury, but uh, at least it was clever perjury. So. <laughs> <laughs> clever, clever perjury brought to you by Judge Clarence Thomas. Uh, all right. That is the show. That is clean up on uh, aisle 45 for week 47. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. I, uh, today was a uh, like just a fire hose of a news day on a Monday. So Friday is going to be ridiculous. Uh, and uh, I look forward to talking to you about whatever happens this week, <laughs> next week, my friend. It's been it's uh, been fun as usual. I love going over that crack and stuff with you because, I mean, it just makes me giddy. Uh, I Me too. I, I, I like that uh, we have and we look for some... Uh, some good news to uh, to sprinkle or sometimes even be the main segment, right? Like there's, you know, there's there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of cleanup left to do. But um, but but th- th- there are I, I firmly believe we are, you know, headed in a direction that's that's better than we were the past four years. So, <sighs> yeah, slowly, slowly, but surely. All right. We'll see you next week. Until then, uh, I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Andrew Torres. And this is Clean Up on Aisle 45. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joel Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. They might be giants have been on the road for too long. Too long. And they might be giants aren't even sorry. Not even sorry. And audiences like the shows too much. Too much. And now they might be giants are playing their breakthrough album Flood. All of it. And they still have time for other songs. They're fooling around. Who can stop They Might Be Giants and their liberal rock agenda? Who? No one. Decide to pay for it with somebody else's money.